Honorable Justice Nariman, President Sir, respected seniors, dear colleagues, the house is full, as is obvious, and it shows the exuberance and the excitement that the bar has to hear the lecture. And uh, Justice Nariman did say that he had a very exhausting day in the court, and till he gets his coffee, I'll request President Sir to please welcome Honorable Justice Nariman and say a few things. May I request uh, Aishwarya ji to welcome uh, Justice Nariman with a bouquet of flowers, please. And I want an ovation for Justice Nariman. <laughs> Justice Nariman, good, e <laughs> good evening. I don't think these people who have come have bargained for that, so I won't take the risk. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Justice Nariman. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's really a great uh, moment for us to have with us uh, Justice Nariman today, who till the other day belonged to us. And I have no doubt in his heart he still lives here in this library, in these corridors, and on this side of the bar. Uh, the, it's very interesting how this uh, you know, lecture came about. And I must uh, reveal a little secret with all of you friends. If you want any relief from Justice Nariman, which he can never deny, you should find him when he's walking outside the court. He was walking in the Lodi garden and I accosted him. I told him that uh, we have been wanting to invite him for a lecture series. And uh, he readily agreed. Uh, we discussed few of the subjects and he suggested a subject which is truly outstanding and extremely. The subject itself is path breaking. Now, in, uh, in Justice Nariman, we have somebody who really uh, can wear too many hats. He not only was an outstanding lawyer, and I have no doubt that in this short span, he has convinced all of us that he is going to be one of the most outstanding judges on our bench. But there are many other qualities that he has, and many of you may be aware about them. If he was not such a great lawyer, a great judge, he would have been a, perhaps a great musician, he would have been a, perhaps an equally great religious leader and a preacher, he would have perhaps been a great historian. He, all these things Justice Nariman combines in himself and that's something which really makes him a very special judge. On legal history, I can definitely vouch having shared I think a ton, I mean thousands of coffee cups over our uh, ta ta canteen tables that the legal history that he knows about not only for India but in the United States as well as United Kingdom is absolutely unbelievable and with his uh, elephantine memory he just doesn't miss anything including which uh, judge had what kind of a character, what kind of a life, perhaps what drink he had and what girlfriend he had. So, so Justice Nariman truly is a legal historian in that sense. Today's subjects, friends, is one of those subjects uh, which he can only, and he perhaps is the only authority who can enlighten us on this extremely interesting subject. We all, you know, deal with laws all the time. We all deal with judgments and journals and all that. But we really don't know what goes behind this, you know, uh, in, this, uh, in the corridors of the judges' uh, uh, chambers and this is very important how law is molded how over centuries or last at least 200 years how judicial system has functioned in countries like England and United States as also in India and that's something which we really all must know I mean young and old all of us must really uh, be aware about that so today's evening promises to be a very uh, I would say very enlightened evening 
and uh, I and I'm sure each one of you are looking forward to hearing Justice uh, Nariman uh, on this uh, very beautiful subject. I thank him from the bottom of my heart on behalf of all my colleagues here in the bar and uh, uh, myself that you have agreed to be here and uh, talk to us. But I can only promise you one thing, Justice Nariman, that this is not the first and the last time that you will be invited here. We are going to bank on you, unless you stop walking in the Lodi Garden, of course. We are going to be banking on you to come and talk to us from time to time. And as I have said in more than, on more than one occasion in the last uh, few months, that this kind of a uh, camaraderie between the bar and the bench is absolutely necessary. Unless bar and bench have a very personalized relationship outside the court, outside the justice delivery system, outside decision-making process, uh, the institution can never grow. And I think uh, in, for institutions to grow, uh, it is very important that we have a better relationship be uh, between us. So having said that, I welcome you and I uh, request you to address us uh, this evening. Thank you very much. Mr. Dave, my beloved father, and all, all of you, my beloved friends. This year happens to be the 800th centennial year of Magna Carta. Now, all of you have heard of Magna Carta. There are one or two little known facts about Magna, Magna Carta which I'll put before you. One is that the document is in Latin. What was the spoken day, sorry, language of the day in King John's time in 1215 AD was French. So it was not really something which was supposed to be understood and which was supposed to percolate downwards. First. Second, Magna Carta was annulled by Pope Innocent III almost immediately. 12, 15 June 1215 was when King John was forced to sign it by the barons. And by August of the same year, Pope Innocent III, who was a very strong and great Pope, actually annulled the document. So what Magna Carta really is known for is more the things done in its name than what was actually done under it. Very little was actually done under it. What is oft quoted is the 39th and the 40th article of Magna Carta. The 39th article is something like our article 21. It doesn't speak of life, but it certainly speaks of liberty first. And it also speaks of property, possessions. So for the first time it was laid down that the king in whom the fount of all authority, including law, lay, had to respect both liberty and property of every citizen in the realm. This again was important. It went right down. And he was to do this by the law and by the judgment of the various peers at that point of time. It was considered correct only if you are judged by your equals. So somebody should not be below or above you. This was the 39th article. The 40th article makes even more interesting reading because it says that we will not sell justice. Interesting at that point of time. Neither will we delay or deny justice. Now with this background, the three names I have chosen, fortunately Dushan gave me the opportunity of choosing a topic of my choice, have to do with Magna Carta in the sense that each one of these three great chief justices, Lord Mansfield, and each of them, mind you, belonged to a separate century. Each was a colossus which bestrode a particular century. Lord Mansfield bestrode the 18th, Chief Justice Marshall of the United States Supreme Court, the 19th, and our great Chief Justice B.K. Mukherjee, the 20th. Each of them had liberty at his heart. And each of them were great exponents of the law as they saw it. Lord Mansfield of the law merchant, because at that point of time it was commerce which was predominant. 
Chief Justice Marshall of the Constitution of the then new Constitution of the U.S. and Chief Justice Mukherjee of our new Constitution at the time that he laid down his great decisions. Coming to Lord Mansfield's first, he was a remarkable man. He was a Scotsman, William Murray by birth. And he was a person who was Solicitor General and Attorney General. So he was a law officer for about 12 years, till 1756. At the time, it was important that the Attorney General be first asked to become Chief Justice of the King's Bench. And Lord Mansfield was so asked, he accepted. And he reigned over the King's Bench, actually reigned for 32 long years. He, in fact, built the commercial law on which all of us rely even today. What was important was, and it was called the law merchant at the time, that the law should follow the merchant and not the other way around. He had great practical wisdom. Quite apart from his relying upon principle, he used to always ask for principle. Case law didn't matter to him. Now, the law followed the merchant in a very practical way. And the illustration I'll give you at the moment will show you how practical this great man was. There was a person who was to be governor sent to Jamaica. And as governor, he was to combine all the three so-called the separation of powers doctrine that we know today, he was to combine all three in them. And Lord Mansfield's advice was asked for, so, long, so far as the judicial department was concerned. Lord Mansfield told him, do exactly as your heart and your head tell you. But be very careful. Don't give reasons. Because if you give reasons, you are bound to be wrong, but your conclusion is bound to be right. Now, it was this practical advice that he gave that this particular governor of Jamaica that actually constitutes the law merchant as we know it today. Why do I say this? First and foremost, he infused morality into the law. This is very important. In those days, you had to have present consideration for a contract. You couldn't have past consideration. Least of all, you couldn't have no consideration. Now suppose somebody, when he was no longer a minor and became 18, said, gave a promise and said that I will actually honor a particular debt that was made during my minority. Lord Mansfield said, that is something which is in the nature of a promise. It may not be a contract yet, but it forms a kind of estoppel. And because it forms that kind of estoppel, I will honor it though it is not made with consideration. Now things like this were very unusual in his time, which is why he was regarded like Lord Denny in our day as a very unusual judge. Another thing that we take for granted today is what Lord Wright said in the classic judgment of Hillers versus Arcos, which is reported in 1932, and which only stated something that Lord Mansfield said for the first time in the 1760s. And what he said was that businessmen often make agreements in extremely clumsy language. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there is no agreement.